Hey everybody, welcome back. Well, we have a lot to go over and a short time to do it. Let's get into it. So we got the doji, okay. S&P, not a doji on the weekly though, is it? And I think that's an important distinction. Didn't feel like that to a lot of people on Friday that we closed at all time highs, but we did. And I think we'd be remiss in not pointing that out. Now, again, 12, 22, 55, you should use what you're comfortable with, but this is what I use and I'm very happy with the results from it. What is happening here, a retest of the 12, a retest of the 12, and then we lift up. Now, we have to spend a lot of time on the macro to understand what happened this week and understand the bond move, but what should you take away from this? You have a doji. Like nothing really happened on Friday to the market itself. Really just rotation. Go take a look at the NQ and let's clean up my 100 levels here and what happened here as well? You just have a doji. Now, is it the uncertainty of next week? It could be, that could be keeping us the way it is, but let's do the simplest thing and just go look at a weekly, right? Let's not tell the market what it's gonna do. Let's just see what's actually happening. And then we just kind of mark these off and then you can see real clear here. Oh, hey, how about that? We actually were able to come down, retest the 12 on the weekly, retest it again and then bounce and make a new high. So we can say anything we want as we're going to in this video, we can talk about everything that happened between GME and the NVIDIA split and where money actually flowed on Friday, which was really kind of weird up to you know all this economic data that is so skewed and why it's so skewed. But at the end of the day, we have a doji on Friday and we closed at a new high. That, they are the facts. And I say it laughingly because it didn't feel like that. Now, if we look at RTY, that's a little bit of a different story. And this is the Russell. Now, again, this is not huge market capitalization, but you wanna know what's going on with small cap names and they can't get out of their own way. Uh, this close right here on the weekly is below that doji. It's a lower low sitting right on the 22. I use a 12, a 22.55. You should use what you're comfortable with. But this control bar right here on the breakdown, you were never able to get over that. And it's been that way since April. And now you're approaching the low of that. So this does not make me feel warm and fuzzy going into what we're about to go into. And again, I think it's important to look at this on the daily and say, does that do anything for us? Not really, no, it doesn't do a lot for us, does it? Does it make you feel good? I, I can't really say that this is an area where you should be looking at shorting. And then of course, you know, 15.9% of it is these the uh, the financial service small cap financial service names and they look like they're rolling but they were green on Friday so that's kind of interesting and this is where it gets super fascinating doesn't it well to me it does like why didn't XBI implode because if rates went up XBI should have dropped instead I have a Doji and I'm sitting right on the 12 and the 22 I'm still above the 55 sometimes looking at the most simplest things like just looking at the sectors for a second tells you a little bit of a different story so why wouldn't rates just crush the XLRA. Why wouldn't that happen? And that didn't happen, did it? And so again, that's certainly something that we wanna pay attention to because it's not something that we're seeing. So we're actually holding in here. So you would expect the REITs to get destroyed. Instead, what did they do? They undercut like SPG, they undercut and then they rallied. And that is a very big distinction to what we see going on here, right? The undercut in the rally is not something you would expect. You would expect the meltdown. You didn't get the meltdown. How about financials? Where's my meltdown? I don't know, I was green. So when we see this, it gives us pause. We don't wanna tell the market what it's gonna do. We wanna interpret what the market's doing and then figure out how to profit from it, right? Because if you look at the financials and you look at what I just showed you and then you overlay that with the dollar, you'd be like, my gosh, financials got crushed on Friday, didn't they? And then you'd go and take a look and you'd go, huh? for lack of a better word, right? You literally pause and go, huh? Because what? that makes zero sense. Because look at where we are, okay? So while well, the dollar, I mean, obviously the dollar, because the dollar rallied and the bond market, you know, the yield rallied, clearly equities got crushed on Friday. And then you go and take a look at them and go, oh, we're, we're, we're green on the day. Like, so it, it, there's a huge disconnect that happened. And I think I understand why we're seeing the disconnect. But in order for us to understand this disconnect between the bond market, the dollar, and the underlying equity prices, we're gonna have to go through a bunch of data. So let's get to it. Now to understand what happened, we have to understand what happened with the week and why, why what happened is so significant. And the easiest way to do this is just a quick review. So this is the economic data on the week. This is from a site called Trading Economics. And they do a really good job. They actually highlight right here exactly what you need. So you know always what you need. What, what are the big numbers? They're always in red. They're always highlighted in red and secondary ones are always in bold. And then the 
ones that really don't matter are just not highlighted at all. So if you don't know what's important economically, they do a really good job by just highlighting it in these three different sectors. And you can actually sort by it too, it's free, I have no affiliation with them, but to watch this data, which I would suggest anybody do, this is the way to do it, in my opinion, and it's free. But manufacturing on the global side, global manufacturing came in, and they came in a little heavier than we thought, right? Remember, anything over 50 is expansion, and we don't wanna see that. Our manufacturing in the US actually came in, we were looking for 49 change, actually came in light. Manufacturing employ employment is actually up. Now we're gonna talk about why manufacturing employment is actually up and what's actually driving the problem with non-farm payrolls. We're gonna get into that in some detail here. And the consensus on openings, well, there aren't any, right? So what's happening is consensus of job openings, they are dropping precipitously. You'll remember this was as high as 10 million. I mean, it was actually a little bit higher. Why this is important is because we're getting this misnomer and we're gonna get into that misnomer in a moment, but we need to focus on that. Now, factory orders, yep, they're still going up. So when we're looking at this data that's coming out, manufacturing's up a little bit globally. Manufacturing of ISM for the U.S. is actually down where we were supposed to be. And job openings are declining. And if you talk to, then you look at the job market, you'll see, you'll see this in a second. But what's important about this is that this is coming down, which means that you have a weaker labor market. Now you go into the ADP employment change. Now ADP employment deals with smaller companies. Smaller companies are doing everything they possibly can by the book. All right, so let's just, we'll just start there. They're doing everything they can by the book and they're dealing with companies that have about 30 employees or less, okay? And the consensus was 175, 152. And that's a pretty big drop, and that's why the market moved. Now, global composite final came in hot, meaning that 54.5, it's a hot number, it's a high number. And what's crazy about it is services PMI final still is high, but they still cut rates, didn't they? Now, ISM services PMI, 53.8, 50.80. So, Services PMI was supposed to try to get under 50. That's what they were looking for. Here's a 49.4. We're trying to get under 50. We came in at 53.8. The market went higher, which was absolutely surprising to me that the market went higher, but yet it did, it went higher. And so we keep going, we're looking at the data. And then we get it to the big dogs. And we always know the big dogs if we're using the site just because they highlight it in red for us, which is really nice. It lets us know what's going on. So if we look at that number, 175. Now that number is composed of three different places. In other words, they come from three different areas to get that non-farm payrolls number. And I think this is gonna show us why with the meeting coming up, which we're gonna address in a moment, why this may be an issue or why this might not be an issue. But that said, it's definitely a point of contention that we have to pay attention to because it's becoming an issue. It's, a, it's okay not to look at it when it's not an issue, but now it is. So 272, 165 was previous, 185 was consensus. This is what you refer to as a hot number when we were doing the pre-market live today. You actually would hear me say, this is the public on YouTube, say, hey, this is a hot number. We have to watch this. And that's exactly what we did. Now, how can payrolls be up and unemployment, right, we're gonna get into this and how that's possible. So non-farm payrolls, the actual is up and the employment's up. And we're gonna explain how that's possible. Also, it's really important to note that hourly earnings, average earnings year over year are up and consensus is here and earnings are actually up, right? Week, weeks are weeks, this never really moves. I don't know really why they put that in there, but this number right here is made up of three very specific categories, government, manufacturing, non-farm and the, the private side. So what the thing about the private side is people look at the ADP and we're gonna show you why this happened in a moment. But manufacturing coming in a little higher and then the government decided to hire again, which they did. And this is usually at 70. When you take a look at that, you'll see that. The forecast was 19. They said, why not double it? Something else I wanna just point out here too. We're losing pricing power. And I'm gonna go off on one quick tangent here. Just understand we're losing pricing power. What does that mean? Used car prices are plummeting and no one's really paying attention to this. They're saying, well, month over month, here you were, the previous, oh, you're declining. Year over year, prices on average are down 12%. The previous was showing 14%, so it's declining. But earlier this week, I showed Mannheim auction. When this starts to happen, this makes people underwater in their cars. People don't wanna be underwater and be making 800, 900, $1,100 a month car payments. They don't wanna be in that position. This becomes a problem, but let's address one issue at a time. So we're gonna to have to look at some of this data just to get a handle on why this is so important, okay? So in front of us, what are we looking at? Well, right in here, all we're doing is looking at a number that was there and now it's here. Well, what is that difference? Well, this specific difference that we're looking at right here is just going to be the private sector. And we saw that the private sector was up. Now, why the discrepancy between this and ADP 
That's the issue, that becomes the rub, and that is something that we're gonna dive into in a second. But when we look at how this played out, you can see it pretty clearly, right? Now, next are government jobs. And what we wanna focus on again with the government jobs are they cut them. So it made you think that they were gonna do a hiring freeze, and this is why last non-farm payroll's number was so low. They just stopped hiring. So we just went on the assumption they were gonna to continue to do that, and that was clearly not the case. Now, what this all leads to is the following. This leads to a big, big drop and where everybody's getting excited and saying, oh, they're definitely gonna cut rates. How can they not cut rates? Look at this, we're gonna have a July cut. And then this comes out, and therein in lies the problem. Now, in front of us is CME Fed Tool, Fed Watch. And what this tells us is exactly what's going on in the markets. And this is really important. Now, to put things in perspective, we're gonna start here. This is July. Now, July, this is when they're supposed to see this, the first chance of a possible cut. And what we're seeing, and I wanna just show you this because I showed this earlier. This is the date right here, June 4th. So you can see right there for June, and that's when I screenshotted this to go over this over on a post-evening video. Because this is important to watch what's supposed to happen, right? And we're gonna to get to it. So where we're at here is 16%. This morning, we were at 22% when the number first came out. So all week, we've been going like this since May 28th, we were at 10 and then we've been creeping up, right? And then we got to 16.5. And then before this morning, we were at 22% on this July number. Take a look at this. This right here, July 31st, 8.8% .8 is where you're at. The day before 21, it was as high as 22. If you go look at the pre-market public video, I actually show it, I actually take the time to show it at 22% because I was shocked that it actually went up. And what this is showing now is that we've gotten cut by a third the rate. Now it was 21%, what I mean is that you got cut down to a third of that number. That's pretty significant. I know it's not exactly a third, you don't have to put that in the comments. But you see where I'm going with this. That's how significant the data was. Now all that other data that came in hot or was light, none of that affected us like this. All I kept doing, no matter if it was hot data or it was light, no matter which way you looked at it, this just kept going up and up, the probability of a rate cut in July. After non-farm payrolls, that was not the case. And that is a significant shift that we have to pay attention to. And here's the bigger shift, in my opinion, and the one that I think we need to really just point out. This is September, and you can always denote by right up here, right? But anyone can go to the site, you just type that in Google, and it's free. 45%, so this is September, chances of a rate cut. And you can always tell where the cut is, because right here it'll say 525 by 550, and then right here, it'll say the current rate is 525 by 550. So you just wanna know where the current is and just go and mark the current and you'll see it from there, it's simple. So what are the chances of it staying where it is? A 51% chance now. There's a 51% chance of it staying here after this number. Okay, where was that before? You had a 31% chance of rates staying here. Now it's 51. That's huge. The important part of this is we flipped the, we flipped the line. So you would, you would all realize that 50% is a demarcation line. And if we go here, we had a 55% chance of one rate cut by September. And then we would go here and say we also had a 13% or 12.9% chance of two rate cuts. So if you're adding all this together and you're looking at it, you're at about 68, 69%, I'm just gonna estimate, for that number to come in between one to two rate cuts. Okay. That dropped to now, you don't even, combined, you don't even have a 50% chance of a rate cut by September. That's how significant the data was. And that's why I wanna go over how this data is being calculated in the flaw. Now, I wanna be really clear when I'm presenting this data. I'm presenting it from the standpoint of a flaw. I'm not presenting it for political reasons. I don't want the political commentary. For those that are in the US, it is what it is, and let's just talk about the data for what it is. Again, that is the purpose of me showing this. So what the Financial Times has done recently is just break out the issue with the data. And I'm wondering if they're doing this for a reason and we're going to see some comments coming up and I'll show you when we might see those comments in a second. But what they show is foreign born, native born. And they show native born right here and foreign born right here. So they have blue for foreign born and red for native born. And this source is the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. Foreign born refers to anyone living in the US who is not a citizen at birth. Both native born and foreign born figures refer to non-institutional civilian populations. See the disparity that's going on here? So what we have going on here is that native born and that they are the more high paying jobs. That's why we're losing pricing pressure. And we'll get to that in a second. That's what's happening here. And so we're starting to see this end of the curve extend and you're seeing the spread. Now they're taking a snapshot probably to make it look worse than it is, but nonetheless, this is where it is. 
And I think that's important. And I want to kind of hammer that home because if you really look at these numbers, right, this number to that number, okay, they're not really that far off if you start getting into it, right? But what they're showing is this divergence. That divergence shows up specifically the longer time frame you go out. Take a look at this. Now, this is compiled by the Hamilton Project and by the Brookings Institute, and they break it into three categories. And you can just see here, and then we have what happens in roughly 1920, in, right in this area, and we can just see this B line. And they break it into categories. And basically what they're doing is they have other non-immigrants, lawful permanent residents, and INA, INA non-immigrants. Some of these words, wordings, I mean, talk about like sal you know, word salad. Uh, or lawful permanent residents. So they break them all out, okay? And they tell you who's who, like LPR lawful permanent residents and people who can apply for status such as refugees. Okay, well, they, they're stagnant. INA or Immigration and Nationality Act immigrants such as students and temporary workers. Okay, they're flat. And then you go other non-immigrants. I don't even understand that, the terminology, but whatever, which CBO refers to as other foreign nationals. And what happens here? They just beeline up. This is skewing the numbers. And this is where the problem's coming because it's that issue that is setting us up for a probably prolonged issue unless it's addressed. And I want to be really clear about this. We're looking at this data to determine the issue and how they're going to handle the Fed meeting. Because I personally think that they're going to address this in some way. They've been floating this out for some time that they need to address the labor market and what's going on there. And I think that what they're going to come out and talk about the jobs, and this is why you're not seeing earnings growth as much, and why you're not seeing jobs on the higher end, but you're seeing on the, on the lower, less skilled end, and it's why you're seeing manufacturing jobs more than anything. If you go back and watch what we just went over for 14 minutes, the important part of this is when you look at the ADP data, that's why it's not in the ADP data and it's in the manufacturing data. And that's a really important distinction, okay? It's in the manufacturing and the private, which is the much larger corporations, not the smaller corporations. There's a big nuance there that we have to pay attention to. But that's coming up and that's going to, I think that it's going to be addressed in some way on the press conference because we're hitting a level now and there was an economist that great, wrote a great piece on it not going to bore you with it, but talking about the new normal is going to just be 200. And we're going to have to address that the new normal is 200 with that. And that might come up that way. But economic projections are going to be big at two o'clock, I think. I think this statement's going to be much bigger than it normally is. And I want to go over that. Obviously, we don't expect them to do a darn thing. And at the same time, they're going to do this. Of course, we're going to get CPI the day before. I personally think that CPI could be decent in our favor, bullish. And I'll explain why in a little bit, but I do think that it could be bullish. Now in front of us is Tradezilla. I'm a huge believer for anybody that's trading that they should, if they're taking it seriously, they should journal. I don't care which one you really use. I've been using Tradezilla because it just, it's very easy. I actually used to create these in spreadsheets for clients when I would do you know, all the one-on-one -on -one stuff, but now I just have them use one of these services. There's so many of them. And it's just auto input, so it's a lot simpler, but I'll just, I just like the breakdown, but it doesn't matter. What I wanna just go over are, are discrepancies and what you're gonna notice about the current market environment and how you can benefit from them and what's going on with the SKU. We talked about the SKU before, and I wanna walk through this NVIDIA trade so that you can see it and how you should be viewing the market right now, because based upon the SKU, and a lot of people are not getting that. People in the community are, are definitely getting it. I can say it, but the SKU's changed. So for just an update, this is going to June 8th. It looks like this account already seems to be having issues with not just this account, but just Thinkorswim seems to be rebooting at the time of recording this. But anyway, um, you would think that integration would have gone better, but that's just a pet peeve. So what we're going to do right now is just touch base on the basics for those that have never seen this before. This is a highly aggressive account where I am highly aggressive. This is not how I would trade everything. But in this account, it's linked to the ideas that, that are presented uh, in the Alpha Chasers community. This account started the year, I think, at like 150 or 160, 160 something. And that which gets measured gets results. So I always ask people, you know, what's your win rate? Again, if you're telling people that your win rate is over 80 or 90 percent, maybe you can do it for a week. Maybe you got lucky, did it for a month. You're not doing it for years or I'd like to see your boat because it's just not realistic. Okay. It just isn't. When you start looking at guys that are legit billionaires and they're in the 50s and the 60s, that somebody else has figured out the method or the secret or they have a special AI bot, they just very simply don't. And that's the one thing about a lot of this data that I find very frustrating. Just show the data, it's just, it's so much easier. And then you can develop your own process by it. So what the goal here is the average win loss, you always want two to one. 
That's what you're shooting for, that two to one. Am I at two to one? No, I'm not. I'm at one nine right now. My win, my average win is 1,070 bucks. And it looks like the average loss is around 673 right now. Trade expectancy. Every time I touch the computer, what do I expect to make? $276 from January to June 8th at the time of recording this. It's Saturday morning. That's why you're getting the, the kind of, well, this is kind of a nice shirt. It's not an awful shirt, right? Not as fancy as the weekday, but it is what it is. It's a Saturday morning at the time of recording. But if you have a win rate around 50, just think about it this way, guys. If your win rate's 50% and you're at two to one, you're killing it. Then it all just becomes about optimization, right? And increasing position size. But if you're not over 50 and you're not near two to one, why are you increasing your position size? I wanna go over that because a lot of people are not getting that. They're trying to like run, walk, crawl, meaning they blow up and then they have to crawl back. No, crawl, walk, run, learn, develop the skill set, and then sprint. So anyway, this is where we're at in the year, and I wanna show you this little divergence that's going on beforehand. So what we're gonna do is just go into here, and when I say skew, let's go to April, because everybody remembers April, right? What April was like. And what you're gonna see in April is April 1st to the 30th, and you're gonna see 80, we had a good month. But look at my win-loss. I was like fighting, I was fighting tooth or nail, right? To just get, get a, anywhere with it. And we had some swings, one of these swings, was just pricing off, but we had some swings. That Probably the most massive swings I had of the year were April. And we were fighting and you see the win rates up, but the trade expectancy is lower than the average of where we're at. And the profit factor was down. And then in May, I started talking about the skew and how the skew is changing. And you're gonna get that from what, what we're about to talk about. But then we go into May and we look at May. And what you're gonna see is the profit factors up, the win ratios up, the average win is up. This is skewed for some reason. It was um, not all on that day. It was also on a different day, but it is what it is. It should be more leveled off, but I think that with the integration, it's just not, just FYI. But what you're gonna see too is now it's just green, 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 right? And why is that? Look at the win ratio and what's going on there. Look at the profit factor. Look at my trade expectancy and why it's over where it is. This kind of skew, this is my kind of market. This is what I traded. This is where I, I really like this kind of volatility because a lot of people don't understand it. If you watch the skew video and how that's changing in that piece from the Mora, you would understand this. The people in the room are getting it um, because I keep hammering it home. Everyone's waiting for the sky to fall. It's not gonna fall. You just have to get used to the new volatility. And it presents a lot of opportunity for us. And let me give you an example. of Now the purpose of me illustrating this, and you're gonna see this trade live, and then I wanna show you some other things that we did as well, is to understand how you can benefit from the volatility. And I believe this was on Thursday the 6th, okay. Now what we did was wait for this to drop and then find a spot, buy it. As soon as it popped, trim, 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 retest, trim, breaks neckline, and then we sell the rest. We're not in this saying, oh, it's gonna go to the moon, we're, we're gonna moon. We're not waiting for some, you know, some guy with a cat poster to show up and make our, our lives better, right? We're taking control of our lives. The reason I'm getting into this is we came in long options, and you're gonna see this trade in a second, where what we did with it was we closed those options as soon as they started to go against us. We didn't play games, we locked in, we made what we can, we hit single, we got on base. Stock pulled down, triggered, you're gonna see exactly what the trigger is in a second, and we got into that trade and we made money. Okay, so we made money here, we made money here. And then again, there was another trade later in the day that presented itself right around here. And I'm gonna show you that and how you can spot those going forward. I get a lot of comments on showing how to do this kind of stuff, and that's why you're seeing what you're seeing. So there were, there were in this particular trade trading day, not only three, but there were actually four trades that we did in just this name. And the reason that those trades exist, one was a carryover, and the reason that those trades exist is because of the skew change that we went over in the previous video. If you watch these videos, you'll understand how it's all linked, right? The longer video is on Saturday, but you'll start getting the concepts and why I'm going over these concepts so that you can go, oh, that's why people think we're gonna crash when this stuff happens, but we're not gonna crash. It's just gonna present an opportunity. How can I spot these opportunities? Your thought process should change, right? You're trying to create a process that you can do over and over again. Not hit once, but keep getting on base over and over again. I'm hammering this home on purpose. So it was a trade here, we did well. Trade here, we did well. Trade here, we did well. And then we were able to push and make a little money here at the end of the day. But let's watch the getting out of this trade live Let's watch this trade live, and then I'll show you the timestamps on this one. And it's important for me to show this stuff not only live, because hindsight's a beautiful thing, guys. You know, when you're trading and someone at the end of the day points at the trade and goes, oh, this is where you get in. Well, thanks, Rocky. What am I supposed to do 
while the trade's going on. And so I'm trying to give you the tools and then show how this is gonna work because let's be realistic about this. If I truly knew what was gonna happen, if I knew that this was gonna go up here, am I selling any of these? I mean, let's just call it what it is, right? I'm not getting out here if I know this is gonna happen. I'm gonna get out up in here, right? I'm not even selling here, am I? No, I'm gonna sell here. So why am I scaling out? Because I don't know what's going to happen, but I know how to manage the trade effectively. And that's the difference, that's, that's the rub, that's what you need to focus on. How do you manage the trade effectively? Let's take a look at getting out of this live and let's take a look at this trade live. My priority is gonna be NVIDIA and managing that NVIDIA trade. Uh, let's get to it and see how we open and go from there. Um, so I'm going to reduce some of that right there and let's get back to it and see how it goes. I'm going to let that drop here. I'm not going to get out of any of these calls yet. I paid nine. They're at 13. Don't give me a follow through bar, but if I get a follow through bar, I'm probably going to kick some of them out. I locked in a bunch of them at 13. I paid nine, nine and change. It's a no brainer. I sold some of those to the 13s. I'm going to hold the rest for now. I think you're going to flip the way you just dropped down, but flip up, but I don't want to play games. I can always buy more stock. I can always buy more options. I got to lock something in that I can play it effectively. The NVIDIA flipped the hammer. So you could buy and use the low there as a stop. It'd be $5, right? If you think you're going to rip, what you do is just go out there. I'm going to buy a little and I'm just going to use that low as my stop. And if I get stopped out, I get stopped out. It's not a big deal, but I don't want to be getting involved later in the day. I want to get involved now. There it goes. Boom. Just like that. If you bought that for a trade and you bought right here, when I bought it, you're already up like four or five bucks. Trimmed. So I trimmed some right into that and I still have a ton of options and calls. Now, if I break down on that bar after it forms, I might kick some more out. I nailed this thing. And I'm just sitting with the rest. Nothing for me to do. Pulled some out already from that day trade. I don't know, I already closed a bunch. So I'm not in any big hurry to close anymore. Okay, so you're cracking. Man, they drop fast, don't they? Sold a bunch of the 13s, holding a bunch. Completely 100% out of the ad of NVIDIA. The rest of my 1300s are at break even, just FYI, which looks like it's gonna happen. So the 1250s, I'm back to break even on NVIDIA. Do we wanna get out of those? I don't think so. Let's hold them for a little bit. Everything's just gonna implode for a little bit anyway. And eventually, you're gonna bounce. So let's go look for some kind of bounce here. See what we can find. Let's just start by throwing an RSI up and looking at a one minute chart. This is not convenient. All right, I like that bar too. And I guarantee you that's a solid bar if I can get it by a market. So I bought, bought NVIDIA. Now, if it breaks that bar, I'm gonna close half of it immediately. And then I'll use that low on the other half. Oh, that was a fast move, wasn't it? So what are we up, three bucks on that? Four bucks already? All right, so right into that, I'll trim some of it. And if I wanna get out of the rest, I can, or I can hold it. So we're up, wow, well, up decent on that. Okay, almost $10 already. All right, so there's a little cheering, $11. So I pulled something out, made 11 bucks, leave the rest on, low a day. So the next level that we'd wanna watch is this right here. So now you're up, what, 20 from there? So right into that, I'm probably gonna pull more out. All right, trimmed, up 18, you're backing off of it. And you're fighting the RSI right here, so I'm not gonna play with that. See it? See how you fought it, right? You tried and you fought, you know, trim more. And I'm gonna still keep the rest of the low. But I probably got out of a solid 50% of it into this move, guys. Now, I hope you follow why we're showing this. Your skew changed. Now, for those that don't know, what I'm saying is that the volatility of the market increased. And as the volatility of the market increases, what's going to happen is the opportunity to day trade is going to go significantly greater. Uh, and it's going to be harder to hold high beta names. You know, people would always think like, well, why wouldn't you just always just buy names like NVIDIA? It just makes so much sense. Well, you couldn't handle the volatility in the past. The volatility would be too great. And that has not been the case. But as everybody knows, games change, you know, adapt or die. Now, you saw the option trade in here. You saw the buy in here and you saw these live where we sold in here and you saw this. And then we have another one of these. And I want to point this out because this is going to happen. So if you don't get anything else out of this video, get this, they are going to stop hunt you. They are going to look for liquidity and they looked for liquidity right here and they found it. They took out the low right there if I move that bar down and they found liquidity on all those stops. So they are going to stop hunt like no other. They are going to stop hunt like you've never seen before in this kind of market. It's really important, really important for you to mark your previous day close and see how you act there and to see how you act at the low. When you have volatility like this, retail's not used to it. Re most retail traders do not understand that the skew has changed, right? Most retail traders are looking at a guy posting a cat picture and saying, oh, we're gonna moon. And um, I'm not saying that we don't 
do those trades, we do. I mean, I, I did exceptionally well trading GME, but it is what it is, guys. You know, just call it what it is. But what I want to do is just point out that this, these were the calls that were overnight over here, uh, 1250s and 1300s. And then we did the GME. I'm not going to walk through the GME trades. We did very well this week with it, though. But here's another example. So we know that they're going to stop hunt in here. So when they stop hunt, what do we do? We do the trade with them. See, the thing about institutions is everybody's going and they, there's this thing, oh, we're going to beat them. You're not going to, let's be real clear about this. And I don't mean to laugh. You are not going to beat them. Okay, the stool, when you think about when I talk about this stool, for example, and this is the macro leg, and this is the fundamental leg, and this is the technical leg, right? For those that don't know, that's how I view the world. And then over top, this is how you sit on your stool. And then if this is a bar over here or wherever you go to hang out, if you sit on that stool, what happens, right? Sometimes you lean on the macro leg, sometimes you're leaning back on the technical leg, right? And this just tells us what's going on, who it's going to affect, right? The what you would think about, you know, the macro side, the who, who gets affected by the what, and then when do we take advantage of what's happening because of who's affected by the what, right? Get it? Okay. But if you really look at this stool, and when I say this, people are like, it makes so much sense. It's not my idea. This is how every institution is set up. Every institution, Goldman has an economics department. They have a research department. They have a technical department. Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, they all have these departments. It's not, you don't go to Morgan Stanley to get research because they just have fundamental analysts. You get their macro view, you get their fundamental view, you get their technical view. You want to learn to trade like they trade. You don't want to, quote, fight the man. You want to trade along with them. You'll hear me say sometimes, we are what? We are the remora. They are the sharks. We can't do this, but we can sure go and find out where they're eating and then just pick up the pieces and eat along with them. But you're not going to be. You, you really need to get that process and that thought process out of your mind that you're going to beat them. It's just, it's just not accurate. All right, but let's get into what we can do by looking at pattern recognition and go from there, right? So we take advantage of what they do and we just get involved with it. But I wanted to point that out. Now there's some other things that I wanna point out that I think are well worth your time. And there's some trades here that for next week that I think make a lot of sense. And I just wanna point some things out ancillary. But one of the biggest things that I think I need to point out about NVIDIA, the split, everyone's like, is the split an issue? I don't know. Usually the first split is an issue. NVIDIA split before several times, right? So NVIDIA is not an issue from a split standpoint, but I do think that tech could have an issue from another standpoint. And let me point that out to you and I'll show you why I think that. But, and I think this is really important to get. Here's AVGO and here's AVGO coming out with earnings. And so what I'm doing is I'm marking AVGO's earnings and you can see that very clearly. Now, if I take NVIDIA and I pop NVIDIA in over this, you will note something that to me is absolutely glaring as I like to say. Here's the high of NVIDIA. And then if we just kind of go through it, here's the high of NVIDIA. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say it again. Here's NVIDIA. Did we hit a high? Kind of went sideways for a couple months, but we did make a little high there and we followed along what? AVGO. Oh, look, earnings. There's the high of NVIDIA. Look, earnings are coming out. You, you read the room, right? Like if there's going to be a time for an issue for tech to slow, tech has been slowing and you can do this also. Like if I take the AVGO, if I overlay the socks with this, right, you're going to see something very similar, right? Not exact, but something very similar to it, right? Okay, and then what if I just took something like XLK, which is the tech space, and I overlaid that with it? You're going to see something very similar, okay? And so this is usually when tech peaks for a month or two. I don't have a clue, but this is what I do. Could be the end of the earnings season and AVGO rings the bell. I don't have an answer to that, but I can just tell you that this is what's happening. And this marks the top. Is it gonna mark the top again? I'm gonna say it again. No one knows. No one knows what's going to happen. All we can do is look at the past and overlay it onto the future and assess the probability of that. That's it, that's all you have, right? And the better you get at this and the more objective you get at, get at this, the more that you're going to kill it, period. I have some names I really just wanna hit home here so that you guys can look at these. The CEG, this is troubling to me and I just wanna point out why and it kind of fits my thesis that we're getting to that kind of toppy level. Um, and this is from someone that owns a bunch of tech, by the way. But you see how we bounced off the 55? I used a 12, a 22, a 55. You should use what you're comfortable with. So we bounced off that 55, tried to rally, got the 12, 22 cross, and then you can't push. You get completely metumboed, retests, and then you fill it in, right? And we all know why, right? The, the, the what, the who, the why, the macro. It was 
got awful. Go watch, the, go watch the beginning of the video. But this was something that we, we need to pay attention to, right? Okay. I think that where we're heading are names like this, like Costco, that people are going to go to the store and crush it. And I think that presents a really good opportunity for us. But if we start looking at what's going on under the hood, gross margins, no matter how much Goldman wants to defend it, were really not great here. Um, and the more I look at it, the more it reminds me that there's an issue. And you're seeing that issue as well with names like SMCI, which has already broken that 55 and unable. And this is disappointing for me because I really like the company, but it is what it is. I have to trade what's happening, not what I want to happen, right? There's a big difference there. I have to trade what's actually happening. And this is what's happening right now. So, okay. If we know that this is what's happening, then that's what we're going to do. We're going to take advantage of this and we're going to watch this. But we already know from the SMCI trade that that's something else we have to watch. You start closing under the 55, you lost institutional support. You're going to want to watch that. Absolutely going to want to watch. So again, AVGO is this week. We're going to want to watch that. We're going to want to pay attention to that. And also you can see this with Dell, it's becoming a real issue for me. Remember, as we went through in the beginning of the video, you know, the dollar is spiked. Okay, ES, let me clean off my million levels. You kind of got your doji here, but these are things that you wanna watch. You wanna pay attention to them, right? And again, you have these weird discrepancies. I'm covering a lot of ground here so that you can see where my head's going and then maybe you can tell me, you know, plug in the holes that I'm missing. If I take a look at XLRE, why are we up? Like that doesn't make any sense to me if the, if the yield is exploding like it did. Remember, we went over this data in the public pre-market live and we basically said, for lack of a better word, that it was bad because I wouldn't say another word, but I don't want to do it with ladies present, but it was really bad data and we just covered that. So this is not something that we want to pay attention to, but it doesn't make sense that this is XLRE held. So there's a lot of like weird things going on, but you know, the names that were moving, all these independent producers that were looking good, like VST, you know, they're not looking, they're not looking great anymore, right? They're just, they're not looking the same way. But you are seeing some movements in some other sectors that we should probably talk about. But again, the NRG, you're holding the 55, does that hold? I don't have a clue. I really don't. This was troubling to me because it was something that I bought um, and I will follow my process, but the higher high and then the complete reject if I have a shooting star that's like falling to the ground, that doesn't make me feel warm and fuzzy. And usually um, that means I have a problem, but I wanna see how this plays out. The reversal was interesting because the reversal to me shouldn't have happened. And what I mean by that is these were all setting up like coin micro strategies. These were all setting up for higher highs. And then they just all completely got matumboed up here as a level to watch. What's interesting with like MSTR is you have this control bar over here, right? So that's again, something I'm paying attention to. And I think that was around that March 18th. Yep. So these are things that we just always want to look at and go, okay, was there some kind of control bar here? Not really. You're breaking out. I had blue skies. That's why I like the trade. But I also think it's important for me to point out sometimes things don't work for me. Hence why you saw my process and you saw the win rate is in the 50s. It's not you know, 95% because that does, doesn't exist, okay? So again, just get that point. I think it's a very important point, but you are seeing some other things here that I think are interesting. So Mexico, what's going on here? Uh, India rebounded, so they're, they seem very happy with what's going on there, right? I mean, that absolutely plummeted and then it rebounded. We had people that took advantage of that in the community. Uh, it was not on my, it was something I wanted to do, but I was too hyper-focused. I don't know why this is dropping so much considering that they knew that this person was going to get in the same way because it was the other person's predecessor, uh, but they seem to be worried about climate, scientists taking control. I, I don't really get it, to be honest with you. I'm not that astute with Mexican politics, um, and nor do I want to be, but this is a brutal, brutal drop. Um, and I would imagine at some point when you overlay this, like this is the 3X bull one that people are trading, but I would imagine when people trade this and they start realizing you're breaking out of third standard deviations and they're widening, right? This is only gonna get so wide. You know, maybe there's a flush here and then after that flush, this becomes something that we should be looking at and like a re another flush down and then maybe that's it. This seems super excessive for something that people knew was going to happen. Um, I, again, if there's something that I'm missing where she says she's going to nationalize something, you know, put, please put it in the comments because I am not a geopolitical expert. I'm certainly not an expert on Mexico, nor do I claim to be. You are, again, seeing pockets, but we're going to go through what those pockets are. Um, in regards to GME, look, guys, it is what it is, okay? You, you really can't be betting your life savings on a cat poster, right? 
Um, it was really a lot of fun to watch that video. It was a lot of fun to watch that and watch half a million people go and look at that. Um, what you want to do is you want to take advantage of this and make money when you can. You know, the, the thing about something like this is you have to call it what it is and maybe you know, maybe you thought it would be more coordinated. I thought it would be more coordinated here and I want to touch base on this. I definitely thought this was going to be more coordinated than it was. I expected there's some kind of big announcement. GME is going to come out and start buying Bitcoin with the billions of dollars they just took out of retail's pockets. I thought there'd be something like that. And instead, it was just some guy with band-aids on his face and a, and a bandage on just hanging out and talking about how great the CEO was. Um, to me, it was a very coordinated effort to just really take money out of the process of retail. You do it that way you want. I know people are not gonna agree with me and say, no, he's a man for the people. Yeah, whatever, man, he made a fortune and you know, probably 95% of people that went along with this did not. So just keep that in mind, do your own research. You know, this was a fun one to trade, but it is what it is. What I would say is look at where the puck is going, not where you want it to go, right? Like, oh, I want the puck to go here, who cares? Like when you go here, like for example, look at this heat map and look at, at what you're able to find from this. So go all companies, okay? And then out of these all companies, you can kind of just click off and go, all right, are we seeing anything of interest? And the answer is that you're gonna start seeing things that are of interest. We know crowd got added for what it got added for, but what the heck is going on here, right? You see the Mobley people traded that in the room. What's going on here? And so then you're looking for this and we know how to do this. You can do it by US companies. You can do it by market cap. We've gone over this a couple of times. You can do it by volume on the day. And that is really very important because you want to sort by that. And then all of a sudden you have snap in here. You have pins in here. This is a little tiny guy and I'm doing all companies, right? So if I went here and just did NASDAQ composite, obviously it's going to be different and look very different, right? But I want to do all companies just because I want to encompass everything. But again, it's is going to look a little different if I do it that way. So we just did all companies and we found two names. Out of those two names, look at pins. Not a care in the world. Absolutely exploding to the upside, right? By doing your own research and learning a process that you can replicate over and over and over every day, I don't need a guy with a cat video or a cat poster, right? I can just keep do this for myself. Seems a lot easier, doesn't it, right? When you start knowing how to connect the dots, same thing here. That's kind of interesting. Like why? Why would you hold that doji breakout? right? Why would you hold in here? Everything else is going down. Why is snap going up? Why is pins going up the way that it is? And again, this is the kind of work that you want to do because this is what you're going to be able to replicate for decades to come. And that's what you should be focused on. That's it.